So Paul, uh, chapter five of the uh, new normal, uh, there's a, an overview of it in Isis Chemical Business this week, and it's got a Beatles cover, um, and the title of the song it relates to is When I'm 64. Why, why is this so relevant to the chapter five of the e-book? Well, well, I, I am tempted to sing the uh, song for you. Go ahead. Uh, but uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> on this occasion <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll spare you. Okay. We picked it uh, because the, 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 the word, first of all, the title, of course, When I'm 64, absolutely sums up the issue of the baby boomers getting older, which the whole book is about. And secondly, of course, the lines in the, in the book, will you still need me, will you still feed me when I'm 64? Those are the critical questions. You know, the Beatles, 1967, asked that question. And of course, in 1967, nobody knew the answer. Life expectancy at that point was 65, which is why they chose it. But last year was the first year that the boomers became, first the boomers became 64. So we're now living the Beatles world when I'm 64. Well, why, why does this particularly affect um, women as they uh, get into the elder demographic? Well, if, if you go back through the previous chapters, Will, as we've discussed them, and you look at the concept of the new normal, which is less debt, lower spending, women, unfortunately, have really got the short straw because many women don't have equal pay for equal work, or if they do, they've only had it in recent years. I mean, in the UK, equal pay for equal work has only been around about 30 to 40 years. Before then, it was unheard of. So other countries exactly the same. So women had a very difficult time. But secondly, of course, they're much more likely to have taken career breaks or to be working uh, part-time. 25% of women work part-time. All of which means when they reach retirement age, they're going to have much less money to live on, but they have longer life expectancy. So very good news, they've got 20 years to live at age 65. Someone like myself will only have 18, but they're going to have less money to live on. Um, why is it important for companies to consider different scenarios for planning, different scenarios for macroeconomic developments? Big word macroeconomic development, what does it mean? It means we've lived in this super cycle for the last 20 or 30 years where all the time more boomers coming through, kids growing up, needing to therefore extend the house, needing new stuff in the house, needing new cars, all of this. Now, unfortunately, we're getting older. When you get to be 55, 60, 65, you don't need a new car every day. You don't need extension of the house and so on. So the business models that we had simply won't work anymore. We're in crisis as far as that goes. And essentially, well, we don't know where the future is going to be because we've never had a 65-year-old generation before. Never had one. No, 65 was life expectancy. If you go back the 100 years, people died average at 50. So we don't know what this is going to be like. What we can be sure of is the transition from where we are to understanding how it's going to be is going to be pretty difficult. So if you, you know, tomorrow maybe everybody says, oh, that's it, you know, the new normal book is right, we'll go that way, very unlikely. Probably going to be lots of turns and throwing, steps back. You know. So contingency planning, absolutely critical. And um, what kind of um, business model ad adaptations can companies consider to meet the needs of older people? So. Well, again, it comes back to our, 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 our friends, the people. So if you're not careful, I really will see. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Very good. Those are <laughs> the key things. And they're the mega trends. The ageing populations, the food production. We can throw in water quality and availability. Um, uh, the, these are the issues. Now, if companies can get to grips with those, but not for the high end, lots of people with lots of money to spend, most of it on debt. No, people without very much money to spend. People living on a pension of ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year. That those are the people in the West that are going to be the core market. You know, it's been lovely when you had a credit card and you could just buy whatever you wanted. Now it's payback time. If companies think people are going to be able to spend like water. They're going to be very sadly, and you can already see those companies that are making that mistake have lost pricing power and are issuing profit warnings. So it's really very serious. Companies really have to start thinking about. I don't have the solutions. Nobody has the solutions. But as soon as we realise that the world has become this uncertain, well, we start to move forward instead of pretending to ourselves, "Oh, tomorrow we'll wake up and this nasty nightmare will have disappeared." Can you highlight any examples of companies that have? been successful so far in adapting to the future.
future? Absolutely, some very big companies. And we are looking at it in more detail in, in, in chapter seven uh, in a couple of months' time. Procter & Gamble, for example, the world's largest consumer, have come up with this wonderful concept of white space. They've looked at their existing business and they said, we're only competing with 50% of the market sectors in which we're operating. We're only competing with 50% of the geographies. Why aren't we in the others? What is holding us back? Why are we caught in the headlights doing what we've always done for 100 years? Yeah. So, you know, there are very big companies out there doing it and some very small new companies doing it as well. So there is lots of, lots of energy going into this and it does release energy because it changes the way people look at things. I'm not just going to do what I did yesterday, I'm actually going to be discovering what's needed for tomorrow. And um, just, just finally, the um, current Eurozone debt crisis, which is rumbling on, how does that relate to the new normal? Well, we were standing here doing Chapter 2, and you asked me what, how I saw things going, and how John Richardson, my co-author, and we said, look, the financial crisis was caused by this age of baby boomers, the model is Japan. What we're going to see is lower levels of debt, lower spending, because Japan is 10 to 15 years ahead of us, it suffered stock market crash, it suffered lower interest rates. The interview was published, ICB was published, everybody laughed. Oh, what a load of nonsense that is. Well, three or four months later, where are we? This is the consensus. We are headed in the direction of Japan. But critically though, most people still haven't made the connection. It's not an accident. It's because of the demographics. It's because our population is aging, like Japan's, so we need to follow and learn from the lessons of Japan if we're going to be successful in the future. Unfortunately, at the moment, as you say, complete turmoil all the time because people, politicians, politicians are in denial. So we're not moving forward. We can't because they won't accept the underlying fact. The key factor is very simple. Two thirds of all the people who've ever lived to the age of 65 in the world are still alive today. That's the challenge. That's the opportunity. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Will.